Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. Episode 13. I'm Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. Now we're here live today in Ho Chi Minh City, formerly Saigon, Vietnam's financial center, here at FCI's 51st annual meeting. FCI is the world's largest open account receivables finance network dedicated to the growth of cross-border trade. And here at Trade Finance Global, we are delighted to be partnered with FCI at this wonderful event. Modern Southeast Asia is one of the fastest growing regions in the world and is one of the most diverse. We have deepening divisions in religion across Indonesia and Malaysia. We have violent insurgencies still in Thailand, Myanmar and the Philippines and the continued influence of China affects the region. I'm delighted to be joined here today by Michael Vatikiotis, who was the keynote speaker earlier today in the conference, an experienced author, journalist, and conflict moderator specializing in Southeast Asia. Michael, welcome to Trade Finance Talks. Thank you for joining me today. So tell us a bit about yourself, your story and experience in Southeast Asia, perhaps starting from when you first moved to Thailand as a student. Thank you. I arrived in Thailand, actually, having already learned the Thai language as a student in London, which is a strange experience to learn a language and about a culture so distant from where I was in the United Kingdom and never having been there. When I got to Thailand in the late 1970s, it was five years after the Vietnam War, there was still very much the evidence of the Cold War in Asia, a virulent fear of communism the beginnings of an economic boom, and the first signs of the explosion of growth and development that characterized the next 30 years. I went back to London. I became a journalist at the BBC, and the BBC eventually sent me back to Indonesia, where I was a correspondent for the BBC before I joined uh, a magazine based in Hong Kong called the Far Eastern Economic Review as its Jakarta correspondent then moving to Malaysia, Thailand, and eventually to Hong Kong as editor. Thank you. Southeast Asia is a strategic highway connecting east and west, home to some 2 million square miles of land and 630 million people. Can you give us a backdrop on the region, having worked in four of Southeast Asia's major cities, crossing all 10 countries in ASEAN? Of course, the most popular narrative for the story of Southeast Asia is its remarkable growth and development since the mid-1970s. And there is simply no way that you can exaggerate the impact and the extent of high levels of economic growth, averaging in some cases 8 to 10% per year over a decade, such as we've seen here in Vietnam. And the role of private and foreign investment, an amazing capacity by both governments and the private sector to look after the capital and banking regulations with remarkable efficiency, very little profligacy, low levels of debt. These have been remarkable conditions by any standard for a region to grow and prosper. Of course, the dark side or the underside is very high levels of inequality. Also, I think, very patchy governance, especially when it comes to effective governance for issues like corruption, pollution in the environment, decentralization of government. I mean, there is a patchy record across Southeast Asia. I think it's very important to point out that one of the key aspects of growth and development in Southeast Asia has been the role of the overseas Chinese community, which forms the core of the business community in most countries and is very cautious, very careful, but at the same time, highly entrepreneurial and very successful. Thanks, Michael. Easternization is a common theme which has been discussed regularly today. Asia is the world's economic trading hub, 
containing 60% of the world's population and almost half of global gross domestic product. Asia has proven resilient to boom and bust cycles and continued growth. So what are the opportunities here? I think that given the growing centrality of Asia in global trade and, and finance and commerce, I think one of the main opportunities is basically to now reconfigure some of the institutions that govern trade, that govern banking, and start to, I think, encourage not just the larger countries, but the smaller and medium-sized countries as well, to play a bigger role in the retooling and reshaping of the financial commercial landscape. This has not been easy because, of course, we're looking at a decline in the role and importance of the countries and the institutions that shape the post-war global order, mainly in Europe and North America. And there is a kind of, it's not so much generational, I think it's geographical. There's a sort of a reluctance to allow this transition to happen, because it means for many Europeans and North Americans, a loss of centrality. And so I think if everything is now going to be more or less centered on Asia, it's important for Asians to play a bigger role in not just the opportunity, uh, exploiting the opportunities themselves, but in shaping the standards of governance and institutional development. So yes, centralization, absolutely key. Over the next few decades, Asia faces a big challenge of wearing the mantle of economic growth and centrality. But what are the biggest challenges here? I think that there are two main challenges that affect stability. And stability, of course, is the key to enduring economic growth and prosperity. I think the first main challenge is that Southeast Asia and Asia generally is an extremely diverse part of the world, full of a multitude of ethnic groups, different religions living side by side, and usually, and in the past, managing to live peacefully together. But this has started to change with, I think, what we've seen a greater move towards communal, ethnic, and religious tensions, not just in Asia, but also in the world. But in Southeast Asia in particular, this is particularly sensitive and difficult because there is just so much diversity. And it's absolutely vital that all the communities are able to live together peacefully. And when that sort of pluralism is disrupted, that actually leads to a loss of confidence, can lead to violence and instability. And I think it's very important that that challenge of managing diversity is met, not just by governments, but by other societies as well. I think the second major challenge, which is one less controllable in the region, is, of course, the return of geopolitics. China's rise for the last 40 years has, of course, affected Southeast Asia considerably. Growing levels of Chinese investment, increasingly China's strategic aims expressed in the region through the Belt and Road Initiative, and the worry that if there is opposition to China's interests, that China may exert itself more muscularly in the region. At the same time, more recently and very recently, the United States has woken up to the fact that China's rise is significant and may start to affect uh, US interests. And this has introduced a polarity into the geopolitics of the region, which is forcing countries in Southeast Asia to choose between uh, support for the United States or for China, which none of the countries in the region want to do. There's traditionally an equilibrium, a balance between the big powers in this very fluid part of the world, which has always had close connections east and west. So I think those are the two main challenges. Overcoming the diversity issue is really down to good governance, effective law enforcement, and a balance between popular sovereignty and effective leadership. I think on the geopolitical front, I think it's very important that the small and medium-sized countries in this region really come together and play a bigger role in cooperating to sort of push back on these geopolitical pressures. Thanks, Michael. And I wanted to go into a little bit more detail on your first point and actually in your book and, and what you talked about earlier today, your book, Blood and Silk, Power and Conflict in Modern Southeast Asia. You talk about some of the huge challenges in terms of religious conflicts, such as secularism in India, Muslim and non-Muslim conflicts in Indonesia, and generally religious orthodoxy in many Southeastern countries. What's the impact of these rising tensions on geopolitics and interregional trade? 
Well, in terms of the threat to pluralism, I think the biggest impact is on investor confidence and the fears that once stable, relatively unified populations and societies will start to fly apart. I think the biggest fear has been in Indonesia, which is the obviously the largest country in Southeast Asia, almost 270 million people, you know, more than almost 90% of whom are Muslim, Sunni Muslims. And therefore, the increasing trajectory towards orthodoxy, not just among Muslims, but among Christians as well, has actually created tensions in society. I think that, you know, generally it's difficult sometimes for this risk to be highlighted because it's a very sensitive issue in many of these countries. But what I see is that the success of democratic transition in some of these countries, like Myanmar, like Indonesia, Malaysia, has exacerbated the divisions between the societies as politicians seek votes. Identity politics has come to the fore, and this has, I think, increased tensions and often led to violence. And so I think that this is one of the biggest threats to stability, which therefore is a factor in terms of economic and commercial confidence. Yes, indeed. And geopolitics is back. We're seeing the divergence of two technological spheres, the East and the West, with the US recently banning Chinese technology giants in its markets convincing friends and allies to steer clear of Huawei. Stories of China building a new operating system for its new technologies are really ruffling the feathers on the other side of the world. What does this mean for the global interconnected economy, and in particular for American values? Yes, this is a major problem, I think, for all of us, which is that what if the United States, which does seem intent on reasserting its primacy, commercially, technologically, in military terms, and geopolitically, what if they take it to extreme lengths and start to create a new sphere of influence that excludes Chinese capital, Chinese technology, Chinese influence? And I think this has put all of us in a very awkward position because none of us really want to choose. We've grown used to the narrative of globalization and of shared responsibility. And I see that Of course, both the United States and China are big powers intent on pursuing their interests. And I think they want their interests to prevail. And they haven't yet been able to come up with a way of sharing the space, a concept of shared responsibility. I think the tech industry is quite concerned because it will be a huge waste of money and opportunity if, say, Google is then cut off from half the world's consumers. And don't forget, it's not just the Chinese market but also maybe the Russian market and parts of Asia that are not going to want to choose between a US and Chinese operating system. So I think these are real concerns. And I don't see yet a willingness on the part of the United States to back down and sort of look at ways and looking at for a sort of shared platform or shared responsibility. In China, on the other hand, I think there's a feeling that, well, we want to be part of the global rules-based order. We want to start making the rules. But there are fears in the West that if China starts to make rules, for instance, in artificial intelligence, they're so far ahead in technological terms, they may start limiting access to technology from the West. So it's a real geopolitical tussle that, unlike the Cold War of the 20th century, is starting to affect our lives because it affects access to technology, it affects issues such as standards and governance. And this is, I think, a very serious polarization that we haven't yet come up with a recipe for dealing with. Thank you, Michael. Very, very interesting there. So I guess moving back on to Southeast Asia and its interconnectedness with China and the rest of the world, what does the future look like for Southeast Asia and what's its future role within the global system? I think the answer to that question is also that it depends on which country we're talking about. The larger countries like Indonesia, the largest country in Southeast Asia, I think clearly as a thriving multi-party democracy for the last 20 years, with a great sense of its own identity and role in the world, I think potentially can increasingly play a role together with other medium-sized countries like Turkey, Mexico, Australia, Korea, can potentially play a bigger role in the international system. Uh, Indonesia is the only country in the world, I believe, that has built into its constitution a resolve to do good in the world. And that's because Indonesia earned its independence or won its independence with the help of the outside world. So 
Indonesia can be set slightly apart. I think the mainland countries of Southeast Asia are increasingly going to be on the frontiers of a growing China space, and therefore are going to be countries through which people will interface with China. And, you know, that Thailand has traditionally been a country that manages very carefully and successfully to survive on the doorstep of China. And I think potentially for the future, this means that these countries will be seen as intermediaries with China. And I think that's something to look at in the future. Vietnam is a remarkably successful country to emerge from the ashes of a very costly war in 1975 to now be a major economy in its own right, growing very, very fast with tremendous potential in all areas of the modern economy. And the same for the Philippines a huge country with remarkable human resources. So we're going to see many of these Southeast Asian countries emerging from long periods of transition and difficulty, playing a bigger role in different ways in global commerce, in trade, in diplomacy, and I think very importantly as we move forward in this whole idea of reshaping the global world order. Thank you. So global commerce is, for for global commerce rather, is incredibly important for businesses to understand the geopolitical and historic context here when dealing with China and perhaps when dealing with markets in Southeast Asia. I guess, what role can the business community play in speaking out, keeping markets open and staving off market polarization? It's an excellent question. And I think one that's not really being asked enough. I think that the shock of the US-China trade row has sort of sent the business community into different corners, and yet they haven't come out. There's been a sort of little bit of commentary on, well, this isn't quite so good for business, but, you know, by and large, the business communities have divided just as the, along the geopolitical divide, which is a shame because I think it's important for business to advocate a sort of pushing back on polarization advocate a reshaping of global rules to better suit the modern world. It's just that I think there aren't really the forums to do this. I mean, no one really talks about APEC anymore, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation body that was set up in the 80s. No one really has much faith, puts much faith in the WTO, the World Trade Organization. The bigger powers essentially invade on the WTO and make it less effective. So I think together with medium-sized and smaller countries, the business communities need to create and shape a new coalition in favor of a more objective reframing of the rules. Now, that's hard for businesses that rely, for instance, on a US market or a Chinese market. But I think it's going to be eventually, it's going to fall to the private sector to put pressure on their governments to sort of make sure that the rules are adapted to this new global situation, wherein China and Asia plays a bigger role. Thank you very much, Michael. And it's great to have you here today, here in Ho Chi Minh City at FCI's 51st annual meeting. I think for any trading businesses, it's so important to consider the role of geopolitics, the role of South Asia's interconnectedness with the rest of the world, and also as a gateway into China. And I think we all need to be mindful of the fact that businesses who operate in different regions, operate around the world, need to speak to each other, both within across markets and also to their own governments, to regulators, to ensure that we continue to thrive for a world where global commerce is good and it's good for trade. Thank you very much for joining us on today's podcast, Mike. Thank you very much for having me, Dinesh, and best of luck with all your endeavours. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.